unspeakable joy. It's where we've been this summer. It's where we, we are continuing. God has spoken, and he's spoken a lot about joy throughout his 66 books that we call uh, the Bible. As we've been going through uh, the Bible this summer, we've been zeroing in specifically on the book of Philippians. If you haven't read it yet, I want to encourage you, read it. If you've already read it, read it again. Mark it up. Mark all those words that God says about joy so we begin to experience even more so what God our Creator desires us to experience, and that is joy, a fruit of the Spirit. As we are connected with Jesus, we get to walk a life of joy. And so we are continuing uh, Philippians chapter 4. We're going to cover, I believe, nine verses together, and this is going to get pretty uh, specific, pretty personal, and so I'm excited to deliver this message for you right now about joy. And, and so we hear this, Philippians chapter 4, verse 1, Paul says, Therefore, My brothers and certainly sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. And so picture this, right? This letter, this sermon was written by Paul in prison, given specifically to a church in Philippi, meeting in one specific house. And certainly there's more churches that get this letter, but specifically, picture this, right? It's not in a synagogue. It's not in a place of worship. It's in somebody's house, maybe 30, maybe 70 people that are hearing this letter. And so he's been saying all that we have heard yet this summer. And now he says this in verse 2, I entreat Udia. I, I plead with Udia and I entreat Syntyche to agree to think the same way in the Lord. So let's stop right there. I don't know if you've been at Trinity for a while, if this is your first time here, uh, but this pastor right here, I don't think I've ever actually called specific people out in my sermon. Paul just did that. And so picture, right, maybe there's 20, maybe there's 70, I don't know exactly how many people are in this house church, but no doubt about it, everybody just turned and looked right at Udia and Syntyche, Right? And Udia and Syntyche, if they haven't been listening so far, if they've kind of been nodding off or something, all of a sudden, wait, he just said our names, right? And certainly this house church's community kind of knows what's going on between these two ladies. We don't know what it was. We can get a sense of, of what it was, but all of a sudden, Paul, God, through Paul, speaks directly to them saying, listen, we need to get you to think the same way. We need you to agree in the Lord, And so Paul continues, and just think about this as we continue now with these scriptures. Some of these verses are very familiar to you all, and some of you have memorized these verses, but think in the mind of Udia and Syntyche, because they're certainly listening right now. If they haven't been listening, they are listening, and they're trying to apply this into their life, specifically in their relationship with one another. And so he says, yes, yes, I ask you also true companion, and we don't know who the true companion is was in this moment. A lot of people say this is one of their husbands to help them agree with each other. Maybe it was Epaphroditus, right, who's taken this letter to the church of Philippi through Paul. Maybe it was Philemon. Maybe it was Titus. Maybe it was Timothy. Maybe it was Luke, the apostle Luke. Uh, Maybe he's just saying, hey, everybody here, you got to all work together to get these two ladies to agree in their relationship. And, And certainly true companion, right, it's even a call out to us as true companions, as people who believe in Jesus to help one another get uh, along. And so he says, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with a man named Clement. Clement's certainly there, but he doesn't seem to have an issue with people, but Clement is there. And the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life, which is amazing, the book of life. And then he says this, verse four, many of us have heard this, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Right? Be joyful. Right? And, and certainly, Yudia and, and Syntyche are hearing this. Right? I need to rejoice. I need to rejoice in the Lord. All right, I, I'm listening. I'm listening. In verse 5, maybe this is even more specific for Yudia and Syntyche. Be reasonable. Right? Let your reasonableness, right? bring some logic. Stop letting emotions guide you. Think about what's going on. Be gentle with one another. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone because everybody knows about your relationship. Everybody knows what's going on and your relationship doesn't affect you, but it affects the world. And guess what? You're supposed to be the light of the world. And how are you made the light of the world when you're disagreeing with each other? Let it be known to everyone the Lord is at hand, right? The Lord Jesus is actually with you. 
When I read that verse and I think about these two ladies and I think about my life, and maybe you've envisioned this before, maybe you haven't, right? Certainly we've heard these promises. Vicar Josh actually prayed about it a moment ago. Jesus, you're with us, right? Emmanuel. Right? A picture if Jesus was actually in your house, if Jesus was actually in your car, right? if Jesus was actually at your workplace, if Jesus was actually right next to you right now, right? Picture that. The truth of our faith is that our omnipresent God, Jesus, is actually there with us. Right? Things change when you live in that reality. He's actually right here. Right? My behavior, my words, my thoughts. Right? Things are just going to change if Jesus was right here. Right? But let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is with you. He's at hand. And then do not be anxious about anything. And anything and everything right, includes relationships. And so, Yudia, I know Syntyche is stressing you out. I know she's disrespecting you. I know she's not responding to you the way that you want her to respond. I know you feel like she's not listening to you. Right? Don't be anxious about that. Don't let that get the best of you. But in everything, in every situation, by prayer, prayer there is to praise, to, to worship. But in everything, by prayer, worship, keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus, your thoughts fixed on Him, and supplication. So supplication is when we take that which causes us anxiety, that which in relationships causes brokenness and stress and a mess, when we take it to God. God, take this. Right? This is real. I need to be honest with you. I don't like this person. I don't like what's going on. My feelings are all a mess. My thoughts are a mess. God, take this from me. I don't want this to rob me of peace and certainly joy. And so by in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let's not miss that. And Paul's going to go at that in a moment. Let your requests be made known to God. In verse 7, we've heard this verse many times. And the peace of God, right, the wholeness of God, the reconciliation that he's given us with him and the reconciliation that he's given us to give to one another, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, which is beyond your imagination and all of your thoughts. It's going to guard your hearts. In this context, that means emotions. It's going to guard your emotions. Think about Syntyche. Think about Yudia. It's going to guard your emotions and your mind, your thoughts about this person in Christ Jesus. And then as if Yudia and Syntyche weren't listening and the rest of the congregation wasn't listening or we weren't listening. Finally, brothers, sisters, right, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, do what? Do what? Think about these things. In case we're wondering what that long list was, just here with a summation of it, the things that are worthy of praise, think about these things, not just about life, but about the relationships, the people in your life. Think, think about the things that are worthy of praise. And then verse 9, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. So that's Paul saying, hey, I'm doing my best to follow Jesus. Right? I'm practicing this. I'm living this out before you practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you you. So, what we want to talk about today as we let these scriptures settle in, we want to talk about having a mind of joy. A mind of joy, a thought process of joy, and not just a mind of joy in life, but as you can already see, it's a mind of joy in our relationships. Our relationships. So, a lot, a lot of us have different relationships with different people in our life. Right, a mind of joy in our relationships with our coworkers, what would that look like? Right, a mind of joy in our relationship with our supervisors, with maybe those we, we oversee, those we work side by side with, our, our neighbors. Right, a mind of joy with our in-laws, right, our mother-in-law, right, our father-in-law, our, our aunts, our uncles, our sisters, our brothers, a mind of joy as a parent in your children, a mind of joy about your parents, right? What would that look like? A mind of joy even in the marriage relationship, right? A mind of joy in all of our relationships. This is where God is getting at as Paul speaks specifically to Yudia and Syntyche, but now as he speaks specifically to you and to me. A psychologist, if they heard me preaching today, they would say, Krupski's talking about metacognitive thinking, 
Well, God actually talked about that because God created our mind and he knows how we work and he has desires for us and he knows what brokenness is brought into the world and not just the world, but into our flesh, into our thought process, into our imaginations and metacognitive thinking is you're thinking about your thinking. That you have thoughts about your thoughts and what are your thoughts about your thoughts? The Apostle Paul, God's word actually has a lot to say about thoughts and about our our minds. We're going to get into that as we go. But what we hear is that we are called to take our thoughts captive. We're called to take our thoughts captive with what? By what? With God's word. Because the truth of the matter is our thoughts take us captive. And we're going to get deep here for a moment, so I want to push you to think. Again, metacognitive thinking. All right. Our thinking actually controls our emotions. Our thinking actually causes us to do what we do. It's not emotions cause our our thinking, and that's not the way God has wired us in case you think, oh, I should let my emotions control me. That's not it. God's word is clear, and if we don't take our thoughts captive, our thoughts are going to take us captive, and in fact, they have. Last week, if you were with us, we're going through Philippians. We talked about joy, different aspects of joy, but there is a clear call right, to really change the way you think because there's a call to repentance, right? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is a hand, right? God is at work. Repent literally means to change the way you think, to change the way you think, right? We need to think about our thinking and we need to think about the things that are worthy of praise in context of relationship with others. Here's what Paul says to the church in Rome in his sermon to them. He says, for to set the mind on the flesh is death, So to set your thoughts, to set your imagination on the flesh is death. If you do this in your relationships, they're going to be broken. There's going to be no reconciliation. There's going to be no love, grace, or mercy given to each other. But to set the mind on the spirit, on God's word, his truth is life and what? Peace. To have peace in our relationships with one another, to have peace in our minds to have peace of mind. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, just a little bit later in his sermon to them, do not be conformed to this world. Don't think as the world thinks. Don't have an imagination as the world has in the main imagination, but be transformed. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. The renewal of your mind, the transformation of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, right? To have God's thoughts, to have his word in our thoughts, in our mind, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The prophet Isaiah said this, 26 verse 3, you, you God, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind, whose thoughts, whose imagination is stayed on you because he's trusting in you when his thoughts are centered on you. The psalmist invites God into his thoughts and also into his emotions because he knows how easily our emotions, our thoughts, can get the best of us, how easily we do what the world's doing or what our flesh wants us to do instead of the Spirit of God. And so the psalmist says this, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Right? Know these uh, emotions. And he's asking God to keep them in check. And he says, try me and know my thoughts. And he continues to say, see if there's any offensive way in me. Right? So you and I, not just Yudia and Syntyche almost 2,000 years ago, right? but you and I, we're being called out today to think about the things that are worthy of praise. In the context of your relationships, think about the things that are worthy of praise. This isn't easy, is it? Um, I think about marriage relationships, and so really the center point of relationships, and certainly marriage is a gift, singleness is a gift as well, according to God's word. Think about that for a second. But the marriage relationships nowadays, right? What's going on with our thought process? Let's begin here. Uh, Communication. Right? And we're going to talk about communicating with our own thoughts in a moment. But the statistics speak, uh, and they share different things, and certainly they're not spot on, but they're pretty accurate in giving us a picture of what's actually happening. And, and this statistics actually changed just in the last seven years as I've been doing research. So research says that the average married couple speaks 27 minutes 
a week. Four minutes a day about. Right? And certainly there's different life stages in the marriage relationship, but that's the average marriage relationship. Communicating. Uh, counselors say this, uh, and years ago, seven years ago, in fact, it was seven minutes a day. That's where most married couples were at, seven minutes a day. So apparently busyness is getting the best of us even, even more. All right? But marriage counselors say this in the research that they've done, the healthy couples, the vitalized couples, the harmonious couples actually have 30 minutes a day. Not four minutes a day, 30 minutes a day. And let's get specific here. Let's give married couples a little bonus here in a moment. This is kind of a sidetrack of the message, but this is all going to make sense in a moment. But take notes if you're married. If you're not taking notes yet, take some notes here. 30 minutes a day, that's two minutes a day saying goodbye to each other. What would that look like? All right, not just, hey, Jenny, I'm leaving. Have a good day. Love you. I'll be home later on. How many seconds did that take? What would two minutes look like if my wife and I just look at each other? I'm going to be leaving now. <laughs> I'm going to miss you. You're leaving now? Oh, my. How are you feeling about that? Let's talk for two minutes. Let's set the timer. Let's just have a goodbye for two minutes. All right, so two minutes uh, a goodbye. That's what they're saying. Four minutes of appreciation a day. What would that look like? Right, I like the way you look today. Good job with your hair. Nice outfit. <laughs> Wow, you're, you're such a hard worker. Wow. Wow, you're such an amazing parent. All right. Wow, I can't believe this, but what would that look like? All right. Four minutes of appreciation, 20-minute reunion. A 20-minute reunion, so that means when you guys would get back together to actually not just go on with your business or what's, what do I have to do, but actually here's what I need to do. I need to have a 20-minute reunion with you. How was your day? All right. Oh, really? How did that make you feel? Oh, really? 20-minute reunion. And then they're actually saying four minutes of physical touch as you communicate. So that's the other four minutes. So holding hands is what is recommended. Four minutes. Or maybe it's just a little cuddle on the couch. Four minutes. That's it. But they also say this, not just 30 minutes a day as far as communication. You should always have two hours by yourself with each other. So like a little date. Two minutes. Two hours. Two hours. And then they say this, there should be a one-hour state of the union address also about your relationship. And so husbands, you're called to look at your wife and say, how are we doing? And listen for an hour. Uh, a state of the union, and not just listen, but communicate, right? Just kidding around here. But that's what they're saying. So here's the, the thought about this for me. Right? If we only have four minutes to communicate, right? How are we communicating with ourselves the rest of the day about our spouse? And not just about our spouse, but how do we communicate with ourselves about the relationships that we have? Because we have a lot of thoughts. Research says this, the average person has 6,000 to 12,000 thoughts a day. An imaginative thought. And you know what's sad? Researchers say this, 80% of those thoughts are negative thoughts about other people. 80% of our thoughts are negative thoughts about other people. Be it God's word, God's truth, God's life, God's spirit says, when you think, think about the things that are worthy of Praise. I was talking to my wife, Jenny, uh, yesterday before uh, this sermon, before I came up here on, on Saturday, I shared with her a little bit of what I, what I found out, this research, and just kind of where we're at, and just asked her, so what do you think about when you think about me when I'm not around? And you know what she said in all honesty, and I always appreciate honesty, because that's truth, right? There's life and truth. She says, it depends what kind of mess you made. <laughs> right? Thank you, honey, for being honest with me. What do we think about when we think about our relationships? Think about the things that are worthy of praise. What would that look like if we actually tried to start tackling this more and more in, in our lives? Um, it was about a year ago when I started to get into a, a different habit in my life, and I think habits are good, right? 1% change equals exponential change, right, as you keep growing. Right, but I really tried to uh, apply a habit, specifically in my relationship with Jenny, 
right? Metacognitive thinking. And so at the end of the day, I'd always, all right, God, I'm going to talk to you about my wife. I'm going to talk to myself about my wife. I'm going to talk about three things that are praiseworthy in her today. And that pattern is helping. And certainly as I get ready to preach a sermon, I believe in spiritual warfare and everything and just letting this digest and come into my relationship with my wife and my relationship with you all and people in my life and how easy it is right, for me to fall into my flesh, to fall into this world and to look at the messes because nobody's perfect and to fix my thoughts on that, to let those take my thoughts captive and to let those control my emotions. And is that good? No, it is not good. We need to fight for this. Right? Yudia and Sintiki heard this message. We don't know if they applied it into their relationship, but we know God was asking them to apply this. And so who's your Sintiki? For lack of a better applying question for you today. Who's your Udia? Right? Relationships. We all have them. I don't know if you know this, but your neighbor is actually God's son, God's daughter. They're your brother and sister. What do you think about them? Is there anything honorable? Is there anything praiseworthy? That we would all be treasure hunters in that sense. And that our thoughts, right? be thoughts that are from God. The things that are worthy of praise. As we let this settle in, um, certainly I, I think we need to ask the question as followers of Jesus, what does Jesus think about us? What does God think about us? If he is calling us to think this way about others, is this the way he thinks about us? Yes or no? And certainly, if you're like me, maybe you don't want to be like me in this moment, but I think this is true for us. There's conviction that takes place, a holy conviction. Or as I look into God's word and as I let God's word look into me, I allow it to do its thing. Right? And I know my thoughts. And there's conviction that takes place for God, I'm sorry. God, I'm believing lies. I'm not believing your word. I'm falling into my flesh. And what does God think about me? Right? What does God think about you when he thinks of you? What is his thought process? We need to think about our thinking about the thoughts that God has of us. Zephaniah, a prophet of old, said this. I want to read this for you. Zephaniah 3.17. He says, The Lord your God is in your midst, right? God is with you. And then he says, He's a mighty one who will save. And he's speaking to a people who are in exile in Babylon. And God's going to restore you. And he's speaking to a people who are longing to see God in the flesh, the Messiah, to come, who are thirsty and hungry for this, waiting for Jesus to come. But you and I are people who know Jesus came. Yes, he's coming again. And this promise is true for us right here and right now. And this promise was true for them even in their exile. He is the mighty one who will save. He has saved. He will continue to save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He is rejoicing over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He is quieting you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. He is exalting over you with loud singing. What does God think about when he thinks about you? The prophet said this, God said this to them, I will remember your sins. Is that what he said? He said, I will remember your sins no more. No more. Right? And yes, we need to keep confessing, living in truth, telling those lies that we're believing to God. We need to do that daily. But the reality of it is, is God is not remembering our sins. In our baptism, right, when Jesus was on that cross, right, when we came into a relationship with him, grace, mercy. Right? He's not seeing our mess. He's not seeing it. 
He's seeing the things that are worthy of praise. And that's good news. That's really good news. He doesn't have an internal struggle with that. That's God. That's your God. And he's calling us to keep in step with the Spirit. He's calling us to follow him. He's calling us to take our thoughts captive with his truth. And when it comes to our relationships with others, to experience joy is to think about the things that are worthy of praise in one another. So as we let this settle in, right? Paul said it, and so I'm, I'm going to say it again. The peace of God. May the peace of God guard, protect our hearts, our emotions, and our minds, both now and forever. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.